the Madera County Jane Doe, identified as Christine Lester. Christine Lester was from Indian Wells, Arizona, and she was known to be heading to Flagstaff to shop for a present, and this was the last time she was ever seen. She got a ride part of the way from a family member and was planning on hitchhiking the rest of the way, something which her family described as being very normal in the area at the time, and this was in 1987. Christine's sisters, Shauna and LaBrenda, were there and remember it clearly. Christine was 24 and was heading out from the Navajo Nation to the Flagstaff Mall because she wanted to get both her mother and her grandmother gifts that were meant for Mother's Day, which was to happen in five days. They would say she hitchhiked all the time and she'd never had any problems at all. She told her uncle that day that she'd be back by the time he got off work, but she was never seen or heard from again. They filed a missing persons report as soon as they were allowed, and for the rest of the years they waited and hoped that she would walk through the door again, fantasizing that she would perhaps come there and introduce her family to them. Instead, a call came that was both wanted and hated. She wasn't living her life anywhere at all. She had in fact been found on Mother's Day in Madera County, California, which is about 724 miles away or 1,165 kilometers. Her family has no idea if she ever made it to Tucson at all or if she was taken directly to where she was found by whoever it was who picked her up hitchhiking. Her sister Shauna would say she was crushed by the news, saying, I didn't want to hear it. I wanted her to come home. The answer came when genetic genealogy eventually matched with her brother and provided the answer they never wanted to be true. Christine was found by a tractor-trailer driver in rural Madera County, California. And authorities described the Jane Doe as tall and thin, likely of Asian descent, and around 30 to 50 years old. The COD was foul play, but the cause wasn't ever released. And they were clear that this was on purpose. They're hoping the information can be used to arrest the perpetrator. Unfortunately, the case went cold, and no one was locally reported missing where she was found. The family received an explicit hateful letter in 1992 or 1993, and this letter was so bad that they kept it. Shauna stated that this letter was weird, that while they didn't believe Christine had a boyfriend, the letter pretended that she did. They also didn't believe she would do any of the explicit things mentioned in the letter. The letter is now in the hands of the authorities. Her two sisters and brother transported her remains from Flagstaff to a family plot on the reservation saying a service there to say goodbye. They'd issued a desperate plea for anyone with any information to come forward. As for leads, they would say that there are several investigative avenues they're approaching right now, but they need to keep them confidential. Christine Lester went unidentified for 36 years. Had she lived, she would be 60 years old today. The Broward County Jane Doe 1998, identified as Eileen Trupner. This one starts on December 19, 1998, in Broward County, Florida. A boater was out for the weekend and was near a boat ramp off US-27 when he found a person who had been there for a few days. She was 35 to 60, white or Hispanic, and had brown hair with gray streaks. She was wearing a long sleeve pullover sweatshirt. On it was written, Sport Team Sport and Members Only and this included red tennis shoes and red stone earrings. She was around 5 foot 6 or 168 centimeters. She weighed 116 pounds or 53 kilograms. Other than being able to tell that she had recent surgery to remove a cyst, there was little known other than the COD was asphyxiation. They do not believe she was subjected to SA. Over the years, Broward County released numerous artistic recreations of what she may have looked like as well as photos of the clothing that she was wearing when she was found. Unfortunately, no one recognized her, and she apparently didn't match any missing persons report. This is a little shocking because it then comes out later that her family was actively looking for her since she went missing in August of 1998. I don't have specific information on whether or not she was reported missing, but once her identification was made using DNA, it came out that her family said they'd even paid a private investigator to look. So it seems highly unlikely that a report wasn't placed unless perhaps they were told they couldn't place one. For her family, it had been a nightmare. 
41-year-old Eileen Trupner was born in Puerto Rico. She had last been living in Florida. She wasn't someone anyone expected to disappear. She had a loving family and two kids. She also had strong friendships. Her family was terrified when she disappeared that something bad had happened to her. They made quick work of hiring someone to find her, and her sister Nancy would say that it never occurred to them that her sister wasn't alive anymore. When the police called, her response to them was, Did you find her? saying she believed that she was alive and happy somewhere. It was a crushing thing to happen when that was not what was expected. Had genealogy not led to a family of three sisters, one of which was missing, Nancy Trepner would still believe that Eileen was out there and choosing not to contact them. I do personally feel like I have to point out that I wonder if something bad happened to her in those missing four months, because there's a four-month gap. What struck me is she's not overweight, but not overly thin either in the photos that we see, including those taken later in her life. But her weight of 116 pounds when she was found, or 53 kilograms, is pretty thin for someone who is five foot six. By comparison, I am a few inches shorter, and that was my weight in high school. I don't know, I was pretty thin. And then for a lot of us, it's pretty unattainable after having kids. And it also does not appear to be the weight of those pictures. That's just my personal opinion. But, but there's also lots of reasons why people lose weight, and perhaps she met somebody in that time. So while sometimes substances are the issue, there's lots of reasons that it could have happened. Or maybe she was just homeless and had a lack of food. Either way, I feel like I have to point out that the weight does not look right to me. Eileen's sister, Nancy, gave an interview saying that Eileen was outgoing, calm, quiet, and kind. Just a really good person who deserved more than what happened. It's clear that if anyone thought she had the ability or was the kind of person to walk away from her kids and sisters, that no one was speaking out about it. While her sisters believe she was still alive, in a lot of cases, it's, it's kind of self-preservation to believe the best you can. So obviously, they need someone to come forward to say what was going on. That four-month gap was not typical at all. And then the other component of this, of course, is whoever did it. They have one person of interest so far, but the police need more to go on. Please come forward if you know anything. I've included the number for Crime Stoppers. Anonymous messages are always helpful. If you don't want to give your name, at least give the information, please. Eileen Trupner went unidentified for 24 years. Had she lived, she would be 65 years old today. The Sandy Jane Doe, also known as the Clackamas County Jane Doe, identified as Ilya Ella Wilkins. In 1976, an 88-year-old woman named Ella Wilkins was living at Bonnox Home for the Aged. This was located in Clackamas County, Oregon. She's been having what was described as some pretty severe memory problems, which was possibly the onset of Alzheimer's. And of course, we know it's not uncommon for those with this diagnosis to wander away. And sadly, Ella was no different. They searched and searched for her, but they weren't able to find her. Four years later, on August 21st, 1981, we know now that the owner of a property on the west side of Leganson Road in Sandy, Oregon, was counting trees on his property. As he walked along, he discovered a human skull. As far as this location goes, it was pretty close to the home where she disappeared. The problem with the identification, however, was that they weren't even sure the skull belonged to a woman, although some suspected it was a woman of advanced age. No other remains were found, and of course in 1981, it's not like you could test the DNA. So while they suspected it might have been her, they had no real way to prove it. In 2010, they did try to test her DNA. And by 2011, they had uploaded into NamUs. But absent a missing person's family donating their own DNA or a match with somebody who's been arrested, there were no hits. And that's really, unfortunately, very common. That's why it's really important to submit your DNA to NamUs if you're missing somebody. And there's a link to a video below that explains how to do that. The weird thing about this is many thought it might have been Ella, so I have no idea why her family members weren't approached to give a sample. Once the new DNA was processed, one suitable for genetic genealogy, they began the process in July of 2022. They built a profile, and as time passed, they ended up speaking to Ella's grandchild, who is still located in Oregon. The in-house team at Othram Labs arranged for that grandchild to provide DNA samples 
and the results would then point to Ella's family within some public databases. And with this, Ella once again had her name. They would say it is our distinct honor to provide the family of Ella Wilkins some resolution by returning her to her next of kin. Dignity is recovered when remains are no longer anonymous, and Ella Wilkins is now accounted for. The Oregon State Examiner's Office will continue our commitment to solve mystery cases and assist families, no matter how unsolvable they may seem. Saying in that closing statement, with the power of investigative genetic genealogy, the case was resolved less than one year after the innovative DNA testing began. This announcement was made on April 4, 2023. Ella Wilkins was born nearly 136 years ago, on July 30, 1887. She went missing just one month before her 89th birthday. Ella has gone unidentified for 41 years. The Galveston John Doe, identified as Calvin Wombo. In May of 2020, a young black man was found on the beach near Kahala Drive in Galveston, Texas, and this was determined an accidental drowning, and sadly he was found on Mother's Day. Louise Gibson, who was a renowned artist, recreated his image. This reminds me of the ones that are coming out of Georgia. It's a great touch for these recreations. In different circumstances, they would be frameable wall art. They're just beautiful. They believed him to be between 18 and 35 and around 5 feet 7 and a weight of about 150 pounds. That would mean 170 centimeters tall and 68 kilograms. He was wearing flip-flops around his wrists, which the authorities thought meant he was possibly too far from shore and he was trying to use them to help as a flotation device. Despite the recreation, the brick wall was still there and... They strongly suspected he was not from the U.S., and it turns out he was not. Initial DNA suggested that he might have been from Kenya or Somalia. Eventually, Othram Labs would use genetic genealogy to identify him. I almost didn't cover this case since it was so recent, but there's one element that got to me, and that's that Calvin was just 24 years old, and he was here as an exchange student from Tanzania. I can't imagine losing your child in another country. It appears that Calvin was pretty well-traveled. I found this account on Twitter that seems to have been his, and it lists his home then as being in London. It appears he was posting in Swahili, so I'm pretty sure this was his account. It has to be hard enough to have a child on the other side of the world, but even more so to then lose your child to that country. As a parent, I can't even imagine, so hopefully the knowledge is a step closer to finding peace for his parents. Calvin went unidentified for two years and 11 months. Had he lived, he would be just 26 years old today. Hyotan, North Korea, John Doe, identified as Corporal Lawrence Robido. This is one of those stories where one realizes how much military families give up in a quest to keep the countries they come from free. And this goes for every country. These men or women don't cause or choose the wars, but they're still out there fighting on our behalf. Lawrence is one of those men. It's a story that starts 95 years ago. Lawrence was born on October 31, 1928, in Saskatchewan, Canada. He eventually moved to the U.S., eventually joining the U.S. Army from Cumberland, Rhode Island. He would find himself assigned to B Company, 1st Battalion, 35th Infantry Regiment, 25th Infantry Division. In 1950, Lawrence was sent overseas, a memory that very clearly lives on in his young brother. It was the last time his brother Maurice ever saw Lawrence. And despite being only four years old, it's forever etched in his memory. He watched his brother get on the bus, and he watched continually as the bus drove away. It was the last time that Maurice, who is now 77, ever saw him. For that reason alone, it's something he says he can't forget. Lawrence was just 22 and, in theory, had his whole life ahead of him when he stepped on that bus. North Korea invaded South Korea in June of that same year, 1950. The troops in Japan were the first U.S. soldiers to ever enter combat. Doing this at some point in mid-July, the United Nations force fought to drive the invading country back across the border pushing them north of the river, and this is the border of China, which you can see here. 
While some articles refer to him as corporal, it appears he was actually promoted to U.S. Army sergeant by the time that China entered the war and then began launching major attacks. It was the Chinese that hit B Company on November 27, 1950. Young Lawrence hadn't even been at war a full six months by this time. B Company was defending Hill 234 at the time, which was 50 miles south of the Chinese border. 203 soldiers were there that day, and of those 203, only 26 men returned to safety. Sergeant Lawrence Rubido and 77 others were reported missing and assumed to be captured. We know now that, along with many others, Lawrence found himself in a North Korean prison camp, and these camps were brutal. On June 27, 1953, three years after Lawrence boarded that bus and waved goodbye to his family, the United Nations Command and North Korean Communist forces signed an armistice that declared the ending of the war. Those who had been previously captured were interrogated on boats by sea for days before returning home. Soldiers who put their lives on the line in some cases were put into booths that were four by four to aid the interrogation of the prisoners of war. As cruel as this sounds, the reason was due to severe brainwashing in these camps. Some soldiers refused to leave, staying in North Korea. It was eventually determined that China and North Korean forces waged systematic abuse on the detainees, attempting to break down their beliefs in an attempt to convince the prisoners to collaborate against their home countries. Although 21 American soldiers refused to ever leave and come home, some of them posing here for the photo with a sign saying, We stay for peace. The commonly accepted reason at the time for the brutal interrogations of those freed, they did eventually determine that 149 POWs held by the Chinese or North Koreans did suffer abuse meant to break down their entire beliefs. There were so many more men at the time, and most were not lucky enough to be freed ever. The camps, as I said, were brutal. Communist troops gathered prisoners and herded them into animal pens treating them as if they were the animals that belonged in those pens. It was horrible. No shelter was provided at all, and the temperatures crashed below 30 degrees below zero, which is negative one Celsius. Some of these men had their outer clothing stolen by their captors, which takes cruelty to a whole nother level, leaving them in thin field jackets to try to survive in the brutal temperatures. And so many of these men were so young, late teens or early 20s, men that should have had a whole life ahead of them. Instead, they lived in those pens given very little food or water. Many got frostbite or starved. Sometimes they would earn food or privileges by saying positive things about communism. Those who survived by the end of the war were very lucky, but the pain they endured would last their whole lifetime. As for our John Doe, it was later confirmed that he was captured and passed in one of those camps. Yet for more than 60 years, it was never over for his family. They always assumed he perished, but they never gave up trying to find him. Sergeant Robido would find his place on a memorial, as you can see here. Yet his family couldn't let it go, because with every fiber of their being, they needed his remains returned home to them. And this finally happened after 70 years. In January, the army announced that he had been found and was finally coming home. It's a bit of a miracle, but his 97-year-old sister is still alive to finally experience the closure. It was his big sister, Lucille, who was presented with several of Lawrence's awards, including the Prisoner of War Medal. Lucille's son, Lawrence's nephew, Larry, followed in his uncle's footsteps in joining the army, serving 22 years himself, proudly representing the uncle he was named after. Larry was also working behind the scenes, trying as best he could to find the remains of his uncle. So many men died in that war also. The United Nations suffered a loss of over 11,000 men, and the Chinese lost three times that number. After the war ended, there was an operation named Operation Glory, and this was at the end of the Korean War on July 27, 1953. Operation Glory's purpose was not to leave men behind. By 1954, North Korea turned over 4,200 remains, of which 3,000 were determined to be Americans. In this case, Lawrence's remains were among them, but, of course, DNA was unknown for much of that time. So they were labeled and buried in Honolulu, Hawaii, on February 16, 1956. 
Lawrence was one of eight children in a French-Canadian family that had moved from Canada to Rhode Island here in the U.S. Amazingly, six of his siblings are still alive, with Lucille being the oldest at 97, and his brother Maurice, who waved goodbye on the bus all those years ago, is the youngest at 77. His family told reporters that they had always hoped he'd be identified during his mother's lifetime, but it wasn't meant to be. Despite this, they were thankful his family finally had the news and the closure they waited for all these years. He boarded that bus 73 years ago, going missing that same year. He was found in 1954 and went unidentified for 67 years. Had he lived, he would be 94 years old today. The Malgador John Doe, identified as Jaron McCauley, who went by the nickname of Buck. Buck was last seen in Portage County, Ohio, on December 31, 2011. At the time, he was living on the 2300 block of Lansinger Road in Suffield, Ohio. That night, he reportedly spoke by phone to his mother and told her he thought that someone was out to get him. Usually that sounds paranoid and like a mental illness, but it's not paranoid if it's true, and that same night, a neighbor reported hearing shots in the vicinity of his home, and that, of course, was the last night his mother spoke to Buck. The police spoke to the family, and it's a sad story. They reported that both of Buck's parents had substance abuse issues and that as a result, he had been exposed to that life since he was a young child. It began issues that he struggled with himself. I was able to find his Facebook and in his last post in the last year he was seen, as you can see here, was that he was fighting it and he was sober. This message was left nine months before he disappeared. It was said, however, that there were rumors in the area he was manufacturing the thing starting with an M that I can't say on YouTube, as well as struggling with perhaps using it. He had a warrant out for misdemeanor arrest at the time for the possession of the M word that is legal in many states. Of course, this was 2011, and I don't think it was legal anywhere except for perhaps as a medical treatment. Either way, this is why the police thought he disappeared and that he was hiding in order to avoid the warrant. It's also possible if his Facebook post was true and stayed true, that perhaps some from his old life weren't okay with this. So there's multiple ways it could have gone wrong. Sadly, Buck's father was terminally ill when Buck disappeared. It's thought to be super unlikely that he would have ever gone quiet while that was happening. So it's believed something probably happened to Buck pretty early on. Additionally, he was due to inherit a significant amount of money. And in that time that's passed, he never collected inheritance or attended either parent's funeral. This information comes from the missing person reports that were filed about him. His family has long believed someone took his life. What we know now is the 24-year-old man disappeared in 2011, and then nearly seven years later, in July of 2018, his skull was found in a peat bog near the Nature Conservatory near Mogador, Ohio, which, as you can see here, is less than six miles from his home location. The COD was impossible to determine, they also tried to locate more remains, but the vegetation in this area is so thick that it was a bit of a miracle his skull was even found. Someone could be standing three feet away and not see a person standing there. It's that thick. Four cadaver dogs did search the area, however, and all that was found was a humerus and upper arm bone, as well as the skull. The bones were at first sent to an anthropologist and then later to the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigations in hopes of extracting DNA. It would take five more years before his name would be announced in April of 2023. Jared Buck McCauley had finally been found. The place where his bones were located is quite a distance from the road also. There's some belief that he was placed there in order to hide the crime. It's noted that if someone were standing in the bog, they would slowly sink if they don't keep moving. So they do believe someone took his life. They desperately now are at a place where they need someone to come forward with information. Jared Buck McCauley was missing for 12 years, and he was an unidentified John Doe for four. Had he lived, he would be 35 years old today. The Pierre John Doe, identified as Stephen Earl Boyce. This one starts almost five decades ago on April 9, 1976 when a fisherman was floating along the Missouri River east of Pierre, South Dakota. It was here he found a person floating in the water. 
That person was fully clothed and near a campground in the area. It appeared to be an accidental event, but they just were unable to identify him. He was around 5'5", five five or 165 centimeters. He had blonde hair and a receding hairline. It was just too little to go on. And of course, since no one was reported missing from the area, it made it that much harder. They did provide the drawing here as a recreation, but it led to no one. This gave them the working theory that the man was from another state. And in fact, a road map was found in his pocket, which appears to back that up. But in 1976, there weren't any databases where all the information was kept in. So, of course, specific jurisdictions weren't speaking with each other. And there was no DNA, obviously, to use. He was buried in Riverside Cemetery in Pierre with a marker that read, Unknown Man. The next move in this case happened in 2020. It was at a time cold cases were being reopened by Pierre police. And at this time, a permit was obtained to exhume his remains. From this point on, they built his DNA profile, and they were successfully able to use genetic genealogy. We know now that Stephen Earl Boyce was 39 and from Seattle, Washington, far from home as he was traveling through South Dakota. One thing that makes me really sad about this case is the only photo we have, or at least at the time that I was doing this, I will check when I finalize the video, but the only photo available was Stephen Boyce in an old arrest photo where his eyes aren't even open. Sometimes I can remove the backgrounds and make it look more respectful, sometimes like a regular picture, but this one is impossible. I really hate to leave it looking this way, but I also want to pay tribute to him with his image. Stephen Earl Boyce was found in Pierre, South Dakota, which is 1,280 miles away from home, or 2,060 kilometers from his home in Seattle, Washington. Stephen Earl Boyce went unidentified for 46 years. Had he lived, he would be 85 years old today. If you are at all interested in helping crowdfund John and Jane Doe cases, I've provided links to the DNA Doe Project and DNA Solves below. Both of those allow you to pick the cases you help fund. The Lander County Jane Doe, identified as Judy Manzarinus. The case started on February 25, 1980, and this was when two hitchhikers were traveling through Nevada. At this time, they were about 13 miles east of Battle Mountain, which is in an area located in Lander County, Nevada, known as Hilltop Canyon. This was an area that was once used for mining. It was there that they found remains scattered the examination determined she was most likely of Native American descent with long, dark hair. She was probably around 25 to 40. They didn't release her COD, but they believed it was clear the scattering of her remains was intentional. I'm trying to figure out a way to explain it. The, the dances around the YouTube rules, and that's always a little bit of a challenge, but let's just say it was done the only way someone could be scattered in multiple places right after someone passed away using a sharp object to separate them from each other. It doesn't say how long she'd been there before she was found, but we know it could not have been more than a year. There were signs someone had hit her in the head, though no one knows for sure if it happened pre- or post-mortem. They noted that some sort of past trauma resulted in a problem with her hip, and they believe she walked in a distinct way. Her torso has never been located. They knew that she had handcrafted sterling silver ring and a coral red triangular stone in a size 7.5 to 8. In 2010, her case was entered into NamUs, which is the National Missing and Unidentified Person System. Even though they had dental records they were trying to compare to others, it didn't work. Nothing happened. There was no movement on the case. Thankfully, DNA was extracted and successfully processed, despite being out in the elements for a long time. This again is thanks to Othram Labs, like so many before. So now we know that Judy was just 19 when she disappeared from Salt Lake City, which is 327 miles or 526 kilometers away from home. I wish I knew more about her life and who she was. I will try again when I go to finalize this segment. It will appear as an editor's note if I found anything additional. They need someone who knows about her to come forward and give information. Even the most simple fact might make all of the difference. Judy went unidentified for 33 years. 
Had she lived the life that she deserved, she would be 52 years old today. To Marshall County John Doe, identified as Jeffrey Kimsey. This story starts on April 15, 1997, when a 17-year-old man was out and about at Catoco Creek in the Union Grove area of Marshall County, Alabama. The 17-year-old man was looking for a good spot to fish when he found the partial remains of a man. This took place near the creek off Eagle Rock Drive. This one is hard to explain and still fall within what I can and can't say on YouTube. Let's just say it was mainly his torso and lower body that was found. The rest was missing. And the COD likely involved a sharp implement starting with a K. Although they aren't even sure about that, his ankles were bound together with rope and wire ties. Someone had some surgical skills, or at least likely had some surgical skills, and they removed his heart and his spleen. The authorities believe this was possibly meant to keep from the COD being found, but it's also possibly just about his identity. Whatever had happened to the man had likely happened three days prior in a different location. They believed him to be white and around 19 to 35, later changing that estimate to 20 to 30, and they thought he was likely around the height of 5'9 or 175 centimeters tall and around 120 to 150 pounds, which is 54 to 68 kilograms. He was wearing a blue, green, and gray vertically striped faded glory short-sleeved pullover shirt, as well as Levi Strauss 501 jeans that were a size 32 by 30. It appears he'd been undressed and then redressed before he was deposited in the location he was found. Whoever did this left numerous air fresheners around him which doesn't make a lot of sense for outside, but perhaps where he originally was at, he was stored there for a while. Parabon Nanolabs would eventually use their special phenotyping program to build a face where one hadn't been before, which in a case like this is especially amazing. They would later conclude that his eyes were likely blue or green, as well as he probably had fair skin with freckles. And for the first time since 1997, they had a possible face. They think his hair was likely strawberry blonde or sandy brown. Additionally, it could be somewhat red. There was an additional drawn recreation, but I didn't find the story behind that one. The interesting part of that for me anyway is that it looks quite different from the phenotyping that was done. But again, they did not have a skull to recreate. So I'm not quite sure what's up with that. That's a little puzzling. For over two decades, the entire case remained shrouded in mystery. Not only was his name unknown, but they also had no idea who did this. Chief Investigator Keith Wilson, who joined the Sheriff's Office in 2000, has worked this case ever since he started. He would say it's one that's always on his mind, and he wishes nothing more than to be able to give the man back his name. It's been suggested that someone could have harvested his organs, and of course this is something that couldn't be ruled out although the sheriff's office is pretty clear they don't think that was the case. They did have some indication that it was someone local, as the area where he was found is pretty remote and not a casual place for someone to have found. So they think someone had information about that location, and additionally, it's a spot that tends to flood, so it was really lucky that he was found at all, although maybe that was the purpose why it was chosen. Thankfully, in April of 1997, it wasn't actively raining, and the creek itself at the time was pretty shallow. They were able to obtain DNA suitable for both CODIS and genetic genealogy. Additionally, they tested the rope he was bound with, hoping that they might find touch DNA. If that was successfully found, it's not been released, but one can hope. The police have had hopes off and on for the identification of both the man and who did this. Leads have come in off and on over the years, and at times the case itself was described as being hot. They had a lot of tips coming in, and were pursuing a lot of clues. One of those at the time is that they believe whoever dumped him off was driving a maroon 1990 Chevy truck with tinted windows. Despite all of this, they would eventually hit a dead end. The sheriff would say that he had combed through missing person reports. This led him to believe it was someone who was never reported missing. Off and on over the years, there was a fair amount of publicity surrounding the case, but unfortunately that brick wall they had hit before just stayed in place. They even hypnotized a potential witness in hopes they would find the information that might break the case open. One article mentioned they were trying to raise the five to $10,000 it cost to do the phenotyping as a snapshot. 
Investigators are hopeful that someone will come forward with information on the case, and they still believe it's solvable. But at this point, all they could do was identify the man, and it turns out that Jeffrey Douglas Kimsey was from the other side of the country, hailing from Santa Barbara, California. He was found 2,114 miles, or 3,403 kilometers, away from home. They still believe it's likely there is some sort of a link to the person who took his life. Under the announcement that was made on Facebook, someone claimed to be his next-door neighbor while he was growing up. I've hidden her name, but I also want to say that I don't have any proof that what she said is truthful, so take this with a grain of salt. What she wrote was, I can't believe this. Jeffrey was my next-door neighbor. We grew up together and went to the same high school. I'm not sure if he graduated, but I do remember not seeing him around anymore. He just disappeared one day, and I didn't really think anything of it. I do remember that he was involved with drugs and had an extensive hydrophonic system set up in his bedroom. Every day, I would find him dumping buckets of water out his window. One day, I heard his mother open his bedroom door, and he flew into a rage, yelling at her to shut the door and never enter his room again, saying it was quite scary and concerning to hear. She went on to suggest he might have been involved with the mafia and suggesting it linked to Mexico. I don't see that there's any proof of this, but her statements about living next to him might shed light on the story. The photos released of Jeffrey are high school photos taken in 1993, 94, and 95. It's not clear if he was ever reported missing, though it appears likely he was not. The DNA found was pretty distant, and it didn't lead to Santa Barbara, where he was from, at least not at first, but instead led to Tennessee, eventually winding back to his parents, who were still living in California. No one knows why Jeffrey was in Alabama in 1997. It's thought he was probably passing through when this happened. One article brings up an unspecified crime that listed Jeffrey Kimsey as the possible offender in that case. But the weird thing is the incident report is dated May 8, 1997, and this was filed in Santa Barbara. However, by then, Jeffrey had already passed away five weeks before, clear across the country. So I'm not sure quite what the truth of that report is. It could obviously involve an incident that took place earlier, but I don't know what kind of incident. His parents would tell the sheriff that they had no idea at all where their son was, but they thought he was out there living his life, saying they had no idea he'd passed so many years before, and this is pretty common. Parabon, in this case, is examining evidence that came with his remains. So it's possible they have DNA from the perpetrator, and that it may eventually lead to who did this. That said, anyone with information is still asked to call. Jeffrey Douglas Kimsey has gone unidentified for 26 years. Had he lived, he would be 46 years old today. The Lincoln County Jane Doe, identified as Melinda Lou Barnhouse. On September 17, 1989, a man was at a rest stop in Lincoln County, Missouri. He stopped to use the bathroom and stretch his legs, and this was off Interstate 55. A man who was traveling from Tennessee to Mississippi made the discovery of a woman behind the bushes. He quickly went to use a phone and contact emergency services, and this would eventually include the Lincoln County coroner. They noted that she was not wearing any clothing except white athletic socks that were rolled down. Those socks had three blue stripes on them. Whoever placed her where she was found didn't even make the slightest effort to cover her up. They simply left her and walked away. She had no obvious wounds or markings on her body. Originally, they had no idea what her COD was. However, the way she was found made it clear it wasn't natural. Eventually, they would determine the cause was asphyxiation, but they couldn't prove whether or not an SA had happened, although it suspected it probably did. They believed the entire thing happened elsewhere before she was moved to that location. I saw a warning that a post-mortem photo is available, which I obviously don't show here, but I always mention them in case others want to look. But I'm not sure it really is a post-mortem. It's listed as a recreation. I think it's one of those where the base is a post-mortem and they digitally manipulate it to open eyes or change a facial expression. This one, however, is a judgment call. I sometimes use those manipulated pictures because they're not really a post-mortem, but this one looks like a post-mortem to me, despite the manipulation, and I don't feel like I can use it. However, for most of us who pay attention to doe cases, 
you might want to check out the picture because it's one that I know I have seen quite a bit. Her eye color was questionable, and as I've talked about on here before, eye color can appear differently as the time passes. I started to say that eye color can change, and I may have worded it that way in other videos, but that's not really the truth. As a result of those examining her, rather they can just appear differently. A film appears over the eye itself, and sometimes it makes it appear opaque. This is why someone might look to have blue eyes despite having brown. So what happens isn't so much that the color changes, as the cornea color stays the same, but the film itself does change. They suspected that the woman may have had Down syndrome, saying that some of her characteristics appeared to the coroner to match this. They also noted that her teeth were in really bad condition, which to them further backed up the possibility of Downs, as those with Down syndrome often have irregularities with their teeth. She wasn't very tall. She was 5'2", or about 157 centimeters. She had curly brown hair and was believed to be mid-teens to 35. Unlike the majority of these cases, however, two men were charged and imprisoned for the crime of what was done to her. One of the men confessed but also minimized the crime, saying that she was a working girl from New Orleans that they picked up with the intention of robbing and instead took her life, as if she somehow deserved it. One of the men, Alfred Case, is in prison in Mississippi, and he's not up for parole until 2030, but there's no word on what happened to the other man. This is another case that we can thank Othram Labs for. The DNA would indicate that she was, in fact, Melinda Lou Barnhouse, who was originally from Maryland. I wish it was clearer exactly what Melinda's situation was. She was just 18, barely an adult. There's also no proof that she was working the streets in order to support herself. And it could be what they considered a degrading statement to further minimize the crime. It's hard to say. I do know she was 18, just barely an adult. She had her whole life ahead of her, and that was taken away. We know she graduated from high school, from the pictures here, and she was just 18, that she was found in September of 1989. So likely she graduated only a few months before this happened. I have no idea what went wrong, but obviously something very bad happened to her. While it appears family released the two photos of her, there so far hasn't been other pictures or mentions of her circumstances. Should that change, I will make an editor's note here now. Melinda Lou Barnhouse was found 1,070 miles or 1,722 kilometers away from home. Melinda went unidentified for 34 years. Had she lived, she would be 52 years old today. The Warner Springs Jane Doe, identified as Claudette Jean Zabolski Powers. In 1986, a couple was walking around the Los Coyotes Indian Reservation in Warner Springs, California. It was here that they stumbled across a campsite, and within it, her remains were found. The COD is listed as foul play, but not saying exactly what happened. No ID was found in the area. A detective would conclude as there was no one missing in the area, and the case itself went cold. A man was also found in that same area, and it's believed he could possibly be related to the case. However, in his case, he was found 14 miles or 22 kilometers away, but it's in what was described as a desolate road in an unincorporated community. And in this case, she was found only 24 miles or 39 kilometers away from home both cases both had on thermal jackets and in part their clothing is what was believed to tie them together and why they think she probably knew the man. It appears his case was also foul play, so it's possible one of them was transported to a different area. Eventually the authorities turned to the only viable tool they had left, genetic genealogy. It was that powerful tool in the end that would give the woman back her name. It eventually led to three generations of Claudette Powers family, her mother, sister, and daughter. It turns out that Claudette disappeared in September of 1984 when she was just 22 years old. At the time that she was found, she would have been 24. No one knows where she was in those in-between years between 1984 and 1986. Or at least that's what's suggested in one of the articles I read. She was found so close to home that I'm not sure. I'm also not finding a post-mortem interval. So for all I know, she was there for two years. Although a different article does suggest she hadn't been there long. It's so hard, and often the articles aren't fully accurate, and that's all I have to go on. 
Her younger sister, Laura, would say, Claudette was a very loving and caring mom. She loved her kids very much, and they loved her very much. We know that Claudette was a Michigan native, and she had just moved to California around 1984. It appears this was the last time her family spoke to her, and of course that was two years before she was found. They believe she had moved to either San Diego or Escondido, and that she was working in a neighborhood restaurant. It's important that if anyone knew her back then that they come forward. They do know that she divorced her husband in 1983. It's not clear where her kids were from 84 on. It's possible they were living with the ex-husband. Her family has asked that those with knowledge break their silence and fill in some of the missing parts of her story. Her sister would say, it's really hard. I would ask my mom all the time, have you tried to find Claudette anymore? Explaining that it's been really hard on her, but also on Claudette's kids. And everyone needs to know what happened and who was responsible. The kids were just toddlers when their mother disappeared. Claudette Jean Zabolski Powers was missing for 39 years, and an unidentified Jane Doe for 37. Had she lived the life she deserved, she would be 61 years old today. Malukal Island, Palo John Doe, identified as Wilbur Mitz. In the fall of 1944, radio man first class Wilbur Mitz was the aviation radio man assigned to Navy Torpedo Squadron 20, USS Enterprise in the U.S. Navy. He was a radio man on a torpedo bomber. The entire crew on this mission were declared missing in action, somewhere on the Palo Islands on September 10, 1944. This happened during a strike mission against Japanese forces as part of Operation Forager. A day later, he and two other officers were listed as having passed away in action. Their aircraft was struck by enemy anti-aircraft fire, after which they crashed into the water near Malakal. While they knew he had perished, they were unable to find or recover his remains. They tried many times after the war to search and recover fallen American personnel. Unfortunately, in the case of Wilbur, it didn't work at the time. In September of 2021, Project Rover, which is a nonprofit that works to recover missing Americans, they went ahead and excavated an area where unknown remains were found, and Wilbur's remains were recovered 77 years after he went missing. This would eventually be sent to the laboratory at Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickman Laboratory in Hawaii for analysis. It would take two more years, but thanks to genetic genealogy, Wilbur Mitt's remains have finally been found and identified. Wilbur was born in 1921 in Missouri eventually moving out of Salinas, California, where he grew up. Wilbur was great at sports, and he was well-known in the area as a result. He was listed as being a member of the Salinas Catholic Youth Organization. He would become the Golden Gloves welterweight champion in 1941. Unfortunately, he passed away when he should have had an entire lifetime ahead of him. It's a huge sacrifice, not just to him, but to his family. Wilbur Mitz was born 102 years ago and he was just 23 when he gave his life for his country. He went unidentified for two years, but was a missing man for 79. On behalf of Crime Hound, I would like to thank Radio Man First Class, Wilbur Mitz, for his service. May he rest in peace. Huge thanks for watching all the way to the end, and a big thanks to all of you who consistently like and comment on the videos. Whether you leave a full comment or an emoji, it makes a huge difference. So if you consistently watch my videos, maybe take a moment to subscribe. It's a huge push toward the videos being suggested to new people. The next goal is 20,000. Thanks everyone for watching. Take care of yourselves and each other.